I want you to turn in your Bibles this morning um, with me to um, um, the Old Testament book of Genesis, way back in the beginning of the Bible. A couple of things I, I really felt the Lord drop on my heart to share with you today, and, and I wanted to just do that. And um, I'm going to read from, from, from Genesis chapter 40, and just going to pick a couple of verses out there, and, um, and we'll see how this, this travels. Chapter 40, and, and I'll read from verse 23. Now, this, is, this story is, um, Genesis is a wonderful book, and it's a book of, of, of stories of, of how God set up these, the redemption, uh, you know, the redemption of Israel, and this particular area in the, in the passage of um, Genesis is, is talking about a man called Joseph. And many of you will know Joseph from the Bible, and Joseph was a young man with a te technicolor dr coat. I was going to say dream, but he had a technicolor coat, and, and he was sold into slavery as a young man, and um, sadly, and many years later, he was in jail, and we all know the story. But he, we find him in, in chapter 40, verse 23, and it says, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. And then move over to chapter 41 and then down to verse 9 and then we find where he remembers him. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, today I am reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants and he imposed me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream. The same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now, a young Hebrew was there with... Sorry, my iPad did something weird then. A young Hebrew was there with a servant... Sorry, my, there was a young Hebrew was there, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams and he interpreted them for, for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position and the other man was impaled. So Joseph, so Pharaoh sent for Joseph and he quickly brought him from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do that, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Wow, what a great story. Now, if you know this particular story from the Old Testament, and my guess is most of you do, Joseph was taken from that place and he was restored into a place. In fact, he wasn't just restored, promoted into a significant role in, in the nation of Egypt and he became the second most important man in Egypt and he did extraordinary things for God. A tremendous story. But I started to think this week about this story and I felt God give me some understanding of these things. You know, I, I can imagine... God walking in out of his throne room up in heaven this particular day and he walks up to all the angels and says, Hey guys, this is the day we're going to extract Joseph. This is the day we're going to go and get Joseph out of his captivity and he's about to step into a destiny. What a great thought that is. And I can imagine all the angels going, Whoa! God's about to do something significant. You know, God has his people. Who knows that? Who knows that God has people that he uses and he raises up, but he's got to get them ready for the destiny God has on their life. You know, there's such a truth in this. If you are called to a high office in God, there's a tremendous high call to get there. If you're called to do something significant for God, then it will take some significance to get you trained to do the thing you're called to do. 
a high office, a high cost. And Joseph in history, history is replete with this man's story. And he is a true player. He is a man that God raised up and truly was a man that was put in a season in time. And yet he languished in jail for many years. In fact, he was 23 years in captivity at 17 years old, his brothers who were jealous of the favour that he had from his father. They hated the fact that his father, their father loved this young man as 17 more than, more than them. And so they jealously got a hold of him and sold him into slavery, sold him to a, to a vagabond that was passing. And this man was yet 17 years old. He hadn't done anything wrong and yet he was saved. He was sold into this place. But God had a plan. God had a plan in the midst of their treachery, in the midst of their, their dastardly act. He watched over this young man. And 23 years later, he was 30 years old, he was put into Pharaoh's service and he learnt in those seasons of his life and he grew and, and I imagine, I've been thinking about him this week and I imagine as he languished in that jail, there were times where he had to deal with bitterness in his heart. He had to deal with God, this is unfair. I don't understand why I'm here. I don't know why you've put me in this jail. You know I haven't done anything wrong. But it, he just kept doing the thing. And I'm sure there were times where he thought, God, it's enough. I can't take it anymore. But he just kept on doing his thing. And he kept being who he was called to be, even in the most difficult times and then there was a time where he interpreted the cupbearers and the the baker's dream they'd been thrown into jail because of because the king was just this kind of on a whim he just threw these two men into jail but two years later he was still in his prison and i want you to move down to chapter um 14 and verse 40. And this is Joseph speaking to the cupbearer. He says to him, when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. Was he discouraged? Absolutely. Was he at the end of it? Probably. And yet two years passed after he asked these men to help him. He remembered the dreams that he had even as a young man. He had significant dreams and he saw this tremendous thing where his father and his, all of his brothers bowed before him. Who remembers that story this morning? And yet Joseph knew that this was a plan. He knew somehow God had deposited something inside of him. And I'm sure there was times where he felt like, hey, this is probably not going to happen. It's probably all done. I'm just called now to, to just serve. You know, when we go through crisis, when we go through difficult times, we, we lessen our goals. Who knows that? You know, God, we used to believe for these things, but I'm in this bad time. You know, God, if you just get me out of this, that'll do. God, I don't, I don't want money anymore. I just want to get out of this problem. Who's ever prayed like that? Because when you're in the midst of a battle, in the midst of something that's pressing against you, all you can think of is, I want this done. I want this over. You know, God, I'll just be happy with no debt, you know. <laughs> I just want this done. And I'm sure he thought it was unjust. But God had a huge, a huge plan for this man's life. And I'm sure as he was stepped into this role under the Pharaoh of Egypt, and he looked back 
And he looked back on those 23 years and he goes, whoa, that's what that was all about. God needed to train him to become, have the ability to lead the nation of Egypt. And where did he choose to do that? He chose to do it in jail. Where better to learn a whole bunch of systems than in jail? This man learned how to look after men. He, le he learned how to do systems. He learned how to put things in place. And eventually God pulled him out of that, that dungeon and placed him in the, one of the highest offices in the land. And he learned about values. He learned that, you know, if I treat people well, I'll be treated, treated well in return. And so many people, they get into a bad time and they start to treat others poorly. They think, well, I feel bad, so I'm just going to treat everyone else bad. But there was something in this man's heart that even in the worst of times, he treated people with respect. He treated people like they were worth something and they were valued. And God was watching. You know, I'm sure in prison he died to many things. So many hopes and so many dreams. And you know, sometimes we go through things in God and he allows things to die inside of our heart. The Bible says, unless, unless a seed of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. Lord, I lay this down. I lay it down. But I still want to serve you. But you know, God found in this young man a heart that was willing to be laid down, willing to even go through the worst things. He didn't understand, I'm sure. Joseph didn't know, hey, one day I'm going to be the second in charge of Egypt. He didn't sit in jail going, well, I don't put up with this because it's going to get good at the end. I'm sure he never knew that. But he did know that God was faithful. He did know, I don't understand why I'm here. I don't understand the difficulty I'm in. But I do know that my God is faithful, even in the worst of times. And this morning, some of you are in times of difficulty. And God's saying to you, I want you to remember, I'm who I said I am. And I am faithful. You know, we remember him as a leading figure in the painting of faith from the Bible, but I'm sure he would have been happy just to live as a free man. He probably got to the point, hey, you know, I just like get out of here and get a wife and, you know, I'm just going to have just a picket fence will do me, you know. I just want to get a life back. I've been in this place too long. And right up to that evening, right up to that day, he thought, well, it's done. But all of a sudden, everything changed. The, the Pharaoh sent for him and suddenly someone's shaving him and giving him a haircut. You're about to be brought into the presence of the Pharaoh. Destiny had arrived. I don't know whether he woke up that morning and thought, well, you know, this is the day. This is the day I'm stepping into destiny. I doubt, doubt that he did. He probably got up and he had his gruel, you know. And suddenly all these soldiers, hey, hey, you've got to go in and see the, fa the Pharaoh? Are you serious? I'm prisoner number 427. Why would the Pharaoh want to see me? Because of the favour of God on your life and because you remain faithful. You know, I'm sure right up to that morning, things still look the same. And I'm sure he thought, hey, I'm forgotten here. God's probably forgotten about me. But friends, he was ready. The scene was set and the plan was afoot. 
And suddenly he was thrown into this place of incredible opportunity, unparalleled authority. I mean, Egypt was the most significant nation in the known world. And this man, Pharaoh, was the most powerful figure there was. And this man, this prisoner, was elevated from a place of ignoble existence, seeking out being a prisoner to being second in charge of the nation because of the favour of God. Wouldn't that be cool? Isn't God good? You know, in Genesis chapter 40, verse 37, it said, the plan seemed good to Pharaoh. This is when he interpreted his dream and he told him, told him what God had shown him about the seven years of fatness and the seven years of leanness. He said, this is going to happen. This is prophetically true. God has spoken here. I've got a, got a truth for you. If you do this, then you'll survive this. Not only will you survive it, you'll thrive through it. And so he told this to Pharaoh and Pharaoh said, the plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So he, he asked them, can we find anyone like this man? one in whom is the Spirit of God. And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all these things known to you, there's no one as discerning and as wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Wow. Wow, what a, what a promotion. He didn't go from being prisoner number 426 to in second in charge of the prison. He went to be second in charge of the nation. The most powerful man in the nation. Why? Because God had a plan. God had a plan. You know, um, this week... I was ministering, I, had to, I got invited down to Fire Church, they've started a college down in, in, in Seaford and, you know, I just feel so excited about that church and, I, you know, I'm not wanting you to leave and go there, but <laughs> I just feel God's going to do something significant in that church and, I, you know, they're a young group of people and dynamic, but they've started a college and they invited me to come down to talk about revival. And um, I just felt God gave me a bit of it. They actually wanted me to talk specifically about revival in relation to Melbourne. And, you know, if you start to study this stuff, you realise, man, there's such significance in this nation. And, um, you know, our, our nation was born for destiny. Who believes that? I absolutely believe that. And, 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 and I, play, I believe um, the, a declaration. I want to put something up on the, on the screen. Thanks, Carol. But um, this, this particular thing that I'm going to put up here is the, is the prayer that, that um, well, actually it wasn't a prayer. It was actually a declaration. Now, this man who, who God sent, his name was Captain Pedro Fernando de Quiros. And um, he, he really had a desire. Now, it's interesting, you need to understand the context of this. He was sent to discover the great southern continent, okay? He was an explorer. Now, many would say, hey, he never got to Australia. He actually, he did this from some of the islands up above Australia. But he believed he was given a mantle or a mandate by God to, to declare and prophesy and speak that which is not over the great southern continent. He stood on a particular day, the 6th of, um, actually, let me read it. Let the heavens, the earth, the waters, and all the creatures and all those present witness that I, Captain Pedro Fernando de Quiros, in the name of Jesus Christ, hoist this emblem of the Holy Cross on which his person was crucified and whereon his grace, he, sorry, he gave his life for the ransom and remedy of all the human race. On this, on this day of Pentecost, 19, 1606, now it's interesting you know, just to make a point here, this is a hundred years before Captain Cook came and discovered Australia. You know, we celebrate Captain Cook as our, as our nation, national hero because he's discovered our nation, but this man dedicated this part of the world on an interesting day. I take possession 
of all this part of the south, as far as the pole, in the name of Jesus, which from now on shall be called the southern land of the Holy Ghost, La Australia de Espirito Santo, and this always and forever, and to this end that all natives and all the said the holy, the sacred evangel may be preached zealously and openly. Now that, friends, is a proclamation. And I, I was sharing with these students this week that this, this happened a hundred years before Captain Cook discovered this nation. This nation had a destiny and it has a destiny. And it's really interesting to me that in 1606, on the day of Pentecost, now what do we know about the day of Pentecost? Pentecost was the day the church was born. We know that, yes? But we also know in the Old Testament, the day of Pentecost represented the day that Moses brought the, the Ten Commandments down from the, the mountain. And, he did, and really it's a, a proclamation of the beginning of the Jewish faith. So Pentecost represents the beginnings of something. And as he did this, there's no accident. This is what I want to get to here. There's no accident in the day that he chose to declare this declaration over our great southern land that Australia is called for greatness. This nation is called to be a nation unique amongst the nations of the world that is dedicated at its birth to be the great south land of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that, friends, the time is coming where we as a nation will come out of, our, out of our locked up destiny and we will step onto the world stage in such a way that the world will go, where did they come from? Because God had a plan. I'm going to just quickly show you a picture, the next picture here. This is in, this is in 1902. Did you know Melbourne had such a significant revival in 1900 to early 1900s? It's a really an interesting story and I might share the whole story with you sometime, but this is 10,000 men filling Melbourne exhibition buildings and they're praying for the great revival. Man, we couldn't get 10,000 men to pray in a room today. I guarantee it because something has shifted. But that happened in the early part. You know, this is not, in fact, this is actually before Federation, I think. 1902, sorry? 1900, just after Federation. And that's, you know, that building was actually set up as the first parliament in our nation. And there's... 10,000 men praying and, you know, I'm going to tell you later on about the story about this, but it's so fascinating. Over 9,000 people got saved in that series of meetings. 9,000 people in a, in, a, in, a, in a state that only had a million people. It was just amazing, you know. God did something extraordinary. And I believe, friends, that there's a destiny upon the great south land of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that this time of beginnings, this, this prophetic proclamation over our nation, that, that we need to believe something to happen. You know, I felt the Lord say to me this week, and take that down, thanks, Carol. I believe the Lord showed or, or spoke to me this week that his church is in this place. You know, um, there's a difference between his church and that church, you know that, don't you? <laughs> His church is, is the ones that are incredibly in love with him, that are waiting with desperation for him to come back. And then there's a church out there. There's two different churches. But I felt like the Lord said to me, that his church is in this place. They've been hidden away and seemingly forgotten. And it's so easy when you're forgotten to get into a place of self-doubt and think, well, look, if I look around, where are we? We're lost. We haven't got any strength. And we believe the enemy. But friends, the cupbearer is about to remember us. I believe God has a plan and a purpose for the great south land. I believe promotion is coming. I believe the Lord is going to step us onto the world stage in this next season, like in an unprecedented way. You know, destiny 
awaits. You know, one of the things that, that happens when you're hidden away is we do, we work away in insignificance in a hidden place, but it's all about getting us ready for our destiny. You know, jo Joseph was ready in that hour and he didn't know the hour was on him. Maybe some things happened the week prior to him being revealed as a new man, but he didn't know. He, he was hidden away. He thought, well, you know, it seems like God has forgotten me. And he probably in his heart didn't think he was ready anymore. You know, when you go through a battle, a real battle, you start to think, well, I don't think I'm going to do that anymore. Who knows what I'm saying? You know, it feels like, wow, God, you know, I thought, I thought that was you. But it seems like it may not have been. And self-doubt and even a resignation about where he was. But God, I believe, was getting him ready. Well, God was getting him ready, but God is getting us ready. And the cup, the cup bearer will remember the bride. You know, I can see the angels and the Lord saying to him, hey, it's time for the Church of Australia to step into her destiny. It's time for my bride in the great Southland, the hidden Southland, the down under Southland. When De Kiros declared this word of the great Southern land, he was speaking a God declaration. And the rest of the world will turn, I, I'm prophesying this to you this morning, the rest of the world will turn their attention to Australia in this next season. God is getting ready to call forth his Australian bride, a people that might seem insignificant. You know, one of the strong messages that's going to come, I want to say to you, is a message that is that God chooses the weak and the foolish to shame the strong. And I was watching something on God TV the other day and I was a particular Christian program and, the, and they were interviewing Brian Houston. And I, if I can say this with respect to Brian, you know, he's an amazing young guy. Well, I say young because he's my age, you know, pretty young. Um, pretty young. But, but he is an amazing guy, but he's never been a guy that I've really had, you know, a lot of time for. And I just think, praise God for what he does and... But, you know, they were interviewing him and, and he started to tell the story of his father. Now, if you don't know the story, I'll quickly tell you. Brian's dad, who was Frank Houston, he was a, an, amazing, an amazing evangelist in our nation. But Frank had a secret and that secret was he was a pedophile. And um, that came out uh, some years ago and Brian, who was in charge of the Assemblies of God at that time, needed to do, needed to actually take his father's credential off him and, and the shame that came with that and his father admitted to what he'd done and, and eventually his father died much younger probably than he should have but he, he fell into a place of, um, you know, just, just absolute ig ignominy, is that the right word? Just where no one wanted to know about Frank Houston anymore and it was a dreadful thing but but, you know, Brian was telling the story and, and um, he was talking about it and he was saying, you know, God has used this story to um, bring me to a new place. And he, he was saying it with such humility. And I thought, wow, you know, there's something transacted in this guy's heart. Now, he could, have, he could have stood back and just tried not to go there, but he spoke of that. And it was kind of interesting because he was on this Christian program and and I was watching the American hosts and they were so uncomfortable because suddenly this guy was exposing sexual sin in their television. And they're going, oh, yes, well, um, um, uh, OK, <laughs> thank you, Brian. <laughs> but what was going on was a transaction of honesty in their midst. And I, th I was watching and going, oh, this is significant. And friends, God loves it when we're able to step in public and say, you know, I have these issues. I have, well, my dad had these issues and he struggled, but I want to say to you today, I'm not going to hide them away. Religion hides things. 
If you have a religious culture, it will never talk about real honesty publicly. It'll talk about things about shaming you. But religion always hides things. But Jesus brings us into that place of safety, being who we are supposed to be in a public place. And I felt like as he was sharing this story, I really felt like, hey, he's actually stepping in from a place of being a pastor of a big church into a place of being an ambassador, an ambassador for a nation. Friends, it's not a shameful thing to admit that our nation was formed by convicts, people that were sent to this nation, many of them who, who had dreadful lives, dreadful situations, but this was a foundation stone for Australia. But God will raise from those things the enemy called nothing, and he'll raise up a people. I absolutely believe that. You know, right now, many of you might feel kind of locked up, Unjustly, I believe your season of captivity is nearly over. You know, I, um, can I share a bit of a personal story with you? We, we've just come through um, the church probably, but more so Sue and I, a fairly huge season of what I would call captivity. And you know, I've always known, and I preach this, and you who know me, hear me say these things, but God supplies our needs according to his riches in glory. You know, I absolutely believe that. And, and I've, you know, I've remained incredibly faithful to do what I know to do, but, but we've been through an incredibly tight time in the last few years financially to the, to the, to the place that I didn't know what to do. And there's been times, and you can talk to some of the staff who'll tell you this stuff, but and um, there's been times where I felt like, hey, God, I'm done, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I can't keep doing this. But God was watching how I'd respond. He was watching how I would, how I would allow this thing to affect my heart. And, you know, friends, he will test you where you find your greatest challenge. The very area that you have a greatest challenge. And for me, I hate owing money. I don't know if that's you, but I, you know, some people don't care about this. They, they, they live on credit cards and, you know, I've, we've ne Sue and I have never lived on credit. We've always paid our bills. It's been what we do. It's the way I live. I've never been a person that's lived in that place. Some people just live in this place of paying off this stuff. But for me, owing money is, is a place I hate to be. And that's exactly where we've been for a while. And, and you know, it's been such a battle, I'll be honest. And, and we've had to trim and like we've owed money, particularly to the owner of the building here, and it's just been tough. And I just feel guilty. I feel like, hey, we shouldn't be doing this. We should be paying our way. And we've, we've had to trim, we've trimmed wages and, you know, and, and Sue and I have given up a lot of our wage. And we've, we've just been through a time where we've got, I don't know what else to do. And for the last couple of months, I've been standing there going, well, God, I've got nothing else to trim. I don't know what else to do. And to be honest with you, there's been a season where I've actually even considered, well, all we can do is maybe, maybe just shut down, maybe just stop. But God kept saying, Mark, I want you to trust me. And if you've ever been in a place where things just don't seem like they're working out, and God's saying to trust you, can I encourage you, trust him? even though it doesn't look like it's going to work out. You know, I've had people say to me when I've had to cut things, I've had to cut wages, I've had to do things, and they've said, where's your faith? And I said, well, I still believe God. But right now, we're going through a season. You know, I've, I've genuinely been through that place where I couldn't see another way, and we've actually discussed if we had to close the place or shut it down and... And I just felt like so strongly, we're doing the wrong thing by the owner. And I, I, I don't understand God. I don't understand why I'm, we're in this place. But I do know you're faithful. You know, but I finally believe the cup bearer has remembered us. 
As of last week, we've we ended into a situation with our owner. I think I told you last week, and we're able to. He's he's forgiven a lot of our debt, which is just amazing, you know. And and I praise God for that. And and he's cut the rent on the building, and and we've just had had an amazing some amazing things happen in this last week, and. You know, we, 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 we're going to be paying $3,000 a month less to, to, to the owner for this property, which is, which is amazing, you know. And it was God just right at the last, honestly, the last week I was thinking, okay, God, okay, I'll just, I'll go and, I'll go and become a baker or something, you know. <laughs> or maybe... I'll just become retired and go and annoy Dorothy Wayne. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Do a garden for her. But this week we've had, and I, you know, and to be honest, I, and this, I was not in a brilliant place, but I, the government came and saw us and me and Sue, and we sat there and we just, we said to them, hey, hey we're done. We can't keep doing this. And, and they, they were so worried that they started ringing us every day. And, and every day this week I've had a phone call from the state government. Had Paul Edgebrook or whatever his name, he's rung me up three times this week. He says, I just want you to know we're there for you. We cannot allow this ministry to fail. We want you to know we're supporting you. And I've had phone call after, I've had visits from people. The state government are now paying a woman three days a week to work with us, to try and help us to find a place suitable for this ministry. Now that is the favour of God. <laughs> and you know, I really feel like God showed me that many of, the, many of the things that have happened was me putting my trust in people and not in him. I said this a few weeks ago and I'm, I'm just really open about sharing. But I, I really went through a season a few years ago and you grow a ministry this big. and We've got literally maybe a hundred volunteers. We have so much going on and the amount of money it costs to run this place is just huge. Our power bills alone are amazingly large. You know, our phone bills and it's just a lot of money. And it's very easy when you're in that time to think, well, how can I fix this? And... Um, so I, 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 you know, people come up with ideas and I said, well, that seems like a good idea. Let's do that. And, and, and so we started some journeys that have taken us to just about now. And I feel like God showed me that that was me putting my trust in people rather than trusting in him. And he had to allow me to go through this season to come back around to a place where he could undo some of the things that I did so we could get ready to be his church again. And I'm excited by the future. I believe we're right where we're supposed to be. And it's been a tough time, but God has been faithful. And, I, you know, I believe God's had to allow some things to fail so he could rebuild it on his kingdom. And you might be in a time in your life where it seems like things are failing for you or things are going bad for you or things are not working like they should and perhaps God is working behind the scenes trying to dismantle some of the things that you've put in place to strengthen yourself. You know, we're, we're notorious for this. We humans building things on our strengths. I mean, Steve used the analogy of covering ourselves with our fig leaves, but... But it's true. We put in place things that will sustain us. And God doesn't have a problem with us being sustained, trust me. But when it comes to his church, he wants the church to trust in him, not trust in the ways of man. And he will develop ways that are kind of unique. You know, you might look at me and say, well, what about this state government? That looks like something. Well, I want to say to you, God is giving us favour with the government because he wants to do something unique through this place. He's going to make a sign and a wonder through this house and people are going to come and say, how did you do that? And we're going to say, we have no idea, but we want to say to you that God is faithful and it wasn't us. It wasn't our skill. I didn't employ a whole lot of clever people to do it, but God is faithful faithful in the midst of the worst and the most difficult times. <laughs> Everything some of you've tried has failed. Is that you this morning? I felt as, and I'm going to finish here, but I, I felt the Lord challenged me that there's some people in the place 
that feel like giving up, just like I felt like giving up. Now, if that's you this morning, God wants to break your captivity. I'm so believing that we've entered into a new season. The cupbearer has remembered us. And if, if you're in that place this morning where you feel like you're in captivity, I want to pray for you. I really just want to pray over you. But if that's you, I want you to stand across the auditorium and I'm going to pray. If you feel like, God, I'm at the end. I can't go any further. Yes, there's some people praying, standing right now. We're going to pray. I want you to just reach out to hell. I'm not going to invite you forward. I just want you to stand up. I want you to close your eyes. Father, you see right across this auditorium those that are standing and they're saying to you, God, there seems like no way out. But I want to say to you, I know you're faithful. And I declare over these ones that are standing across this auditorium this morning the power of God to break them free of their captivity in Jesus' name. Father, I break off them the failure of the past. I pray open their heads, their minds to the things that they perhaps have put into their lives that have, that have been the areas that have led them into this captivity. But Lord, get them ready because the cupbearer cup is going to remember them in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, now, if you agree, just say to the Lord, Father, I receive that. I take that. I just receive that over my life that I would be free. I would be fully, fully free in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want everyone to stand right across the auditorium. We're going to, if, we, if I could get Luke to come, please. I want to sing a, a victory song this morning, Luke. And I want you to declare to the, to the earth, to the enemy, I want you to declare to yourself, hey, even though it looks this way, I know my God is faithful. Even though it looks like it may not work out, I know my God is faithful. He's faithful. So we're going to sing this song and we're going to declare today as a people that we're where God wants us to be. You know, I want to say to you, this church is about to enter into a season of newness. I really believe that. God is about to renew our mandate. He's about to give us the, the, the jewels that he's kept in hiding for us. This church is about to step into her destiny. I believe that we are called for greater things than this. This is not our destiny, friends. We are called. And God is going to do something that I believe some of you would be amazed if I were to tell you this morning. So let's sing together, Luke, please. Well, God bless you, everyone. Don't forget, next, next weekend we have this, this seminar. It goes on Friday and Saturday, all day Saturday. There is no charge to this, but you need to register. It's, it will give you a whole, a whole teaching on interpreting dreams. And, and on Sunday morning we have uh, Adrian Beale and... Adam Thompson. Yeah, Adam Thompson going to be ministering here. So please go and ring somebody up and say, hey, come to church on Sunday. Now, listen, can I encourage you to be here on time next week? You guys are slack. You all come about, it gets to 10 o'clock and there's like six people here. So please try and come early next week. And why don't you ring someone up because they're going to be blessed. Now, today we have a wonderful lunch down at Esperado. It'll be the last one down there for the year. But we've got uh, some hot fresh rolls who likes hot fresh crisp, crispy rolls just cooked today and we've got them down there with with ham off the bone and turkey and lots of salad so that's all down there for a donation and some coffee so please come and join us for lunch down in Esperado. you're all welcome and it's going to be great so bless you have an amazing day and we'll see you